Well, the psychosocial health of impacts, and, and they're clearly there. Uh, we already see them. Uh, uh, we, we need to know, and as I've said before, uh, my feeling is the major problem we have right now is we're rushing into something too quickly. And again, I would commend New York State for at least holding off for a bit. So what are the concerns? We've mentioned worker health and safety, air pollution, certainly water pollution. There's a lot of, uh, 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 of ways that this can get into the water. Uh, there's uh, the soil. We've had a uh, recent visit in Pittsburgh from a group from Quebec worried about uh, representing the farmers of Quebec, worrying about the uh, agricultural impacts of having this in the, uh, the soil. There's noise issues. Uh, we just got something from a, a, a group from a bird sanctuary near, near Buffalo worrying about a compressor that's going to be put on their side. And uh, they're worried about the, the, the chemicals, but gee, if, if I've got a, a bird sanctuary, I, I just wonder whether the noise would have an impact. You know, I just don't know. Uh, this, I mentioned community safety, uh, the psychosocial disruption and sustainability, and you've even got the global climate change with all this methane getting out. Methane's a very potent uh, uh, source of uh, global climate change. It's uh, almost as potent as, as carbon dioxide. It's more potent molecule to molecule, but its impact is about uh, uh, a third or 30% or so of the overall global climate change is, is related to uh, methane. So what are the questions? And, um, how is flow back and produced water disposed of? Uh, in Pennsylvania, we've got a sort of voluntary agreement that they won't go through the privately, through the uh, publicly owned treatment works. Uh, is it affecting groundwater supply or private drinking water supplies? If you look overall where people get their water in the United States, it's mostly uh, from, uh, uh, from our, our faucets that come from a uh, major source for the community. But if you go into rural areas, then you're, you're really into mostly groundwater. So if you, if you look at it from the point of view of, of what's going to happen in rural areas, you're looking at the potential for, 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 acute, for problems that are much different than they are for us city folks who get things out of a, a treatment plant. Um, you've already got some problems down with an air quality. Is this going to be worse? What about the, the radionuclides? Where are they going to go? Uh, the whole issues of stress, the pipelines, the traffic. Uh, you've got uh, well casings, you're putting corrosive fluids down there. Some people have, have speculated that this will uh, uh, won't last very long. And very important, what are the plans for emergency response? These, there's already been explosions. We've had pipes that, uh, pipelines that have burst. What is our emergency response? How quickly do we respond? How do we know when something is taken care of? Uh, Last summer, I was in a, uh, a, a state park. Um, in the next campground, there was a bunch of young men who just found out that this 36-mile trail that they were going to backpack uh, on, spend two nights on, that this, there was a sign up saying there is no drinking water uh, that is usable along it because of a uh, Marcellus Shale blowout situation. Uh, I don't know what they did because they were gone by the time I woke up the next morning, but uh, I don't know whether they, they went and hiked on this and said the hell with it. Uh, they were going to drink the water. Well, they didn't. But they were pretty upset about that. That's, it sounds like a small issue, but it's not. How do we deal with those kind of issues? How do we respond quickly so that if there is a problem, we can clean it up? Because there will be problems. So we've got a need for government, vigorous government oversight, and that means that you've got to demand it. I mean, there's only vigorous government oversight if the public demands it. I mentioned the aggregate sources versus a single source. That's for the, not only for the airsheds and ozone, but it's for watersheds as well. And you've got the whole issue of the risk to the individual living there, the risk to the community as a whole, and the overall population risk, because some of these things are right you know, some of these things for those of us who don't live nearby seem like, oh well, that's your problem. I got other things I got to worry about. I'm not going to worry about it. But in fact, some of these go beyond that. It's not just the local issues with the local people, and it's not just the money issue. The head of a major museum in, in Pittsburgh was telling me recently that he's got a uh, uh, he had an IRA. They they have a uh, large. Uh, 96 acre plot of land that they've been offered something in the tens of millions of dollars for the mineral rights for. 
they use it as an, as an ecological preserve and they use it to teach uh, to have museum, uh, have museum trips out there. Uh, and he got a letter from uh, one of uh, his members saying that uh, uh, he was, that this member would stop his dues and stop being a member if they took, if, if the, this uh, museum took the money. And he said to me, he said, well, look, if, if this is a money issue, on the one hand, I got $36 worth of dues. On the other hand, I got $30 million worth of uh, funds that will endow our museum forever. Obviously, if I judge this just as a money issue, I would take the money. It can't be just the money issue. It's got to be more than that. And we all have to be involved in thinking it through. So it's another issue. Um, this is something that our center did, which is to look at what the State Department of Environmental Protection has reported in terms of Marcella Shale violations per well. So this is basically the state fining an a, a well, a well owner, for having violated, violated state laws. And we look at this in a per well basis, and these are only relatively large ones, or we, we, we got rid of any company that has less than 10. And there's 28 companies in here, and it's, uh, uh, the key thing is that there are five companies which have had no violations whatsoever, and then you have this tremendous spread where you have some companies that look like they just couldn't care less. Our regulatory approaches have to be used, our citizen approaches have to be used to make sure that the companies uh, with the major violations don't do business, that they do not, they're not allowed to come back in there and I feel we in another place. We've got to hold these people accountable. In a sense, it's a way of rewarding the five that have had no violations because the way the business enterprise works, if you don't get rewarded for good behavior, it's so hard to maintain your competitive stance for doing that good behavior. Uh, so we've got to punish and reward as well as we go through looking at these. And if people are going to sign up for uh, uh, these, uh, you know, with a company, you should know what the company's uh, record is. You should be able to look that up. I know in, in, in Pennsylvania we certainly can. And you can look that up uh, on a variety of different uh, sites to find out what the, what the company's been doing up to that. So, as I said, you've got to do a lot of things to make sure that we weed out those companies that are not doing the job well. And you can do the job well. I, I'd like to show this slide because this is Paul O'Neill, who was the president of Alcoa for a number of years. He was the Secretary of Treasury under, under George, uh, second George Bush, if you may remember him design. But uh, Paul's a, uh, someone who believes that safety culture, uh, that the only acceptable amount of, uh, of accidents in the workplace is zero. Now, when he came in as CEO of Alcoa, uh, they were at 1.86, in other words, that 1987 number is a little bit below the national average, they were doing pretty well comparatively. And he just basically said it was zero. And we trained occupational medicine residents in, in New Jersey and in Pittsburgh, and we used to tell them that, that a major decision point for them as to whether they should take a job for a company, from a company was to ask the company what happened to the bonus of the local plant manager who had a violation from the occupational safety and health, and they'd gotten fined. Did that figure in on their bonus at all? And if it didn't, you don't want to work there. Well, he fired the manager. Basically, he said the only thing acceptable is zero, and this is how they drove it down. This is not where, where, where BP was at, quite clearly. <laughs> there are different cultures and companies. We've got to make sure that the culture is the right one if they're going to do that. Um, this point I've already made already about the aggregate of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of these activities and, and should be made. I wanted to be sure, a lot of the concern is in drinking water, I wanted to make sure that, that we understand that there's a whole bunch of different issues. There's, frac there's the fracking fluids themselves. Uh, they're only used a relatively short time, but if you're going to keep on drilling and drilling and drilling in a watershed, you're going to get uh, basically accumulation over time. There's the degradation products there. These, these compounds, you might test them, but then again, they're going to degrade and change in the environment and you need to test what they're going to be as well as what they are when they start. Uh, and that hasn't been done as well. And as I pointed out before, we have a lot of naturally occurring materials in these formations which we're going to bring up. And uh, we've we got to be, be 
be ready for those kind of surprises. I talked a little bit about technically enhanced naturally occurring uh, radioactive material. I wanted to spell it out for you. I know I went through it quickly before. Um, I, the oil, company, oil companies have a buy on some of the rules that other companies would have for radioactivity. They have a buy on some of the rules that uh, companies have for lots of things. Uh, when I teach environmental policy, I, I, I show a, um, a little rider to a, uh, one of EPA's laws having to do with noise, which basically prevents uh, the state of Florida or anyone living nearby Cape Canaveral from uh, prosecuting NASA for when the uh, shuttles lift off, the noise will exceed the allowable decibel level. That makes sense. That's sort of one of these uh, little things that, okay, yeah, yeah, you're going to exceed the decibel level as permitted uh, with a shuttle launch to occur every so often, and, and so we'll let that happen. There are similar riders on bills which allow the oil industry to get away with an awful lot of things that other companies cannot. Uh, one of them has to do with radiation, and uh, I won't go into more detail, but it, it makes it easy uh, for them to not pay as much attention as others have to to these kind of issues. Uh, we need to find out whether, whether there'll be more radioactivity in drinking water, or whether there'll be more radon off gas in, into uh, basements uh, of places near Marsala. Shall we? We just we haven't even started to look at these things. They need to be looked at. There's a crime and police response issue. Uh, in Wyoming, that was uh, turned out to be one of the major health impacts was the amount of drug, uh, and, uh, drug use and crime when you suddenly had a bunch of folks who weren't attached to the community coming in in a, a, in a wildcat kind of situation. Uh, this is a quote from the previous state police commissioner under our previous governor saying that they already were having all sorts of issues uh, and that was last year before our new governor came in. So uh, uh, the, the issues of, of getting the additional resources to deal with this is, is important, I think, needs to be looked at wherever. Uh, one of the issues is, is how do we get reassurance? I'm certainly not doing what I'd like to do, which is to basically say, okay, here are the expected impacts. Here's benzene, benzene causes leukemia. Here's the level of benzene that I worry about. Here's the background levels of benzene. This will exceed background and will not exceed background. I'm not telling you those kind of things. I don't have the data to be able to do so. When you hear about it, though, from industry, there's a fair amount of distrust, and at least in our state, there's a fair amount of distrust of, of, of our governor as well. It seems to be very pro-industry, and so the uh, Marcella Shale Commission that he put together had a lot of industry folks on it. Now, they still might come out and do exactly the right thing, but there's that distrust there. And if you're part of the community that's involved, you really want a place to go and trust, and in the past, academia, has played that role, certainly University of Rochester has been involved in playing that role, and as an academic I can tell you I'm very uncomfortable in the role I'm in right now because I just simply don't know it. It doesn't help that by and large we seem to be ignoring the health effects. The state commission in the state of Pennsylvania had some very good people on it, pro-industry or not, knowledgeable people, no one with any health background whatsoever. Well, is that just our governor? No. President Obama's commission uh, had put together by Stephen Chu, the head of the uh, Department of Energy. Excellent commission. He's had a number of hearings around the country about deep well drilling and uh, not just Marcella Shell. Uh, good people on it. Nobody with any health background. Uh, Former EPA Administrator Riley was asked by President Obama to put together a commission to look at the, uh, uh, the deep water horizon, the Gulf spill. He recently reported on that and what the uh, issues are, the recommendations of what we should do. Again, no one with any health background. As we go and listen to the community issues, as, we, as these various commissions have their hearings in the community, overwhelmingly, the questions, the concerns are, I'm sick, my kids are sick, something's wrong, it's affecting our health, 
And yet, somehow or other, we as a nation don't put together uh, the kind of health expertise we need to, do, to deal with this. Uh, when I first uh, started to look at this issue, uh, my impression, which is only a few months ago, my impression was that our state health department in, in Pennsylvania had not yet been involved in the issue. Now it's involved now, and we're trying, we, we hope that the commission will come out with some uh, good recommendations and move forward, but we're not sure yet. So we need ongoing health studies. They should be with community engagement. The, the community outreach program, which is sponsoring this with their, their colleagues, is one is an example of the kind of, of, of approach that the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is, is taking with its major centers, Rochester being one of them, and requiring that there be a community outreach component. I can sit with all the chemicals that might come out of this and tell you what I, as a toxicologist, think might be the health effects and design an epidemiological study that looks for those health effects. That would be dumb of me to do. If we're going to design an epidemiological study, we first have to listen to what people are saying are their health effects and design the study as much or more around that as around what the toxicology might be based upon the chemical structure. So that's the kind of thing that needs to be done, and we're starting to move forward with that in Pennsylvania. Uh, and as I know, the study is going on in Texas as well, and in Wyoming, and trying to do this. Um, without the community engagement, we're going to we're going to we'll, we're going to miss the causally related health impacts, and we will end up dismissing uh, things that are negative findings because we never asked. We need to ask what people are concerned about. There's three rules we've always used about interacting with the community. First is that trust needs to be earned, and never pretend to give the community options when you've already made up your mind. That's something government does over and over again, industry does over and over again. They come and they say to a citizen's group, well, here are some options, tell us what you think. They've already made up their mind, and I think every community sees through that. And the other thing, of course, is every, every situation is different, and certainly the Marcellus Shale is, is different. Uh, this is a sustainability issue, and it's in its long-range thing, and that requires we look across the various disciplines. We have lots of different approaches to it. Uh, we've got to look across uh, the environmental, economic, and social and health issues. Uh, you can't you can't just as we're doing now in Pennsylvania, just trucking some of this stuff into Ohio. Uh, some of the water that's coming out that needs to be dealt with, it's going to Ohio. The folks in Ohio seem to be happy to accept it because it's source of income for them. Uh, the risk of the truck traffic, the diesel exhaust, the, the impacts on the road, the dust generation, they're all, they're all probably exceeding the risks of the, I think probably, I'm not sure, but probably exceeding the risks of, the, of keeping that fluid there in our water. Uh, but I don't know, again, we're just doing these things. But we did it in New Jersey, I, I don't know how many of you know, but New York Harbor is dredged uh, by the Port Authority of New York, and the dredge spoils are sent to old mines in New Jersey, in, in Pennsylvania, in the Scranton area, and are dumped down into the old mines. Well, that you know, seems to be a solution, except what about that truck traffic? Uh, and when you deal with sustainability, a key aspect of sustainability is the multi generational aspect. We've got to think of this beyond just this year, next year, the year after. We have to think of this in terms of what the long-term impacts are going to be. Now, I'm going to stop here. What I did is to, is to add some slides at the end that uh, uh, are related to uh, just sort of re uh, going through it again. If you folks didn't know about fracking, but you know about fracking, and I've covered the area, so I'd rather save the time for, for, for people to ask questions. So let me stop here and thank you for being so attentive. So um, as the, the questions are being gathered, um, so that, that we can process them and, and figure out what we're going to ask first, um, I want to give you just a break by, because before um, doing so, I wonder if you ended by talking about community engagement and ways of, of collecting information, talking about what's important. Could you um, just tell us a little bit about Frack Tracker? Frack Tracker is basically a, uh, something that the Center for Healthy Environments and Communities put together. 
And it's just, it's an information source that uh, is fed in from lots of different organizations. It's actually, uh, we do the operational aspect of it. It's really run by uh, a, a very good uh, uh, Pennsylvania water-based uh, foundation that is responsible for it. And it's a place where you can go up and look in all sorts of, uh, uh, if you want information, that's what we've got. So just look it up, frack tracker, or look up, or look up CHEC, Center for Healthy Environment and Community, CHEC, we're still number one in Google and those four letter combinations. Uh, and you, you will find out information of just about any kind you want. And we're open to including information that others uh, have gathered and, and put in there. Uh, so it's a way to, to just keep the communication going. Uh, as things develop. They're developing very quickly. And I um, wanted to just to give you a quick scenario and get your feedback for it um, as I process these. So about three weeks ago, I went out to Garfield County, Colorado, which is the only place that has done a health impacts assessment of hydrofracking in their area. And anecdotally, I, I had a headache the whole time I was trying that. <laughs> but um, their environmental health director for, for the county um, seems much more concerned about air quality and impacts than water quality. And most of what we've heard about in this area has been water quality impacts. I wondered if you've thought at all about what should be the focus of health people um, you know, in the Marcella Shale area, particularly what should be the focus and role for local health departments? Uh, I think uh, you know, the, the easy answer is all of the above. I, it's, I'm fascinated by the fact that Garfield County is more concerned about air quality. Uh, we've got lots of water here. Uh, they've got very little water out there. And so I, I would imagine that, the, but yet they, they've exceeded their ozone standard for the first time in Wyoming. Uh, and they think it's because of the Marcellus Shale production of uh, ozone precursors. Ozone is something that's made out of, uh, in the air, out of nitrogen oxides and, and hydrocarbons. And anything that's burning is producing both. So we get our mobile sources are getting nitrogen oxides and hydrocarbons. In a place like the, the Pittsburgh area, where we have so many coal-fired power plants, uh, we get a lot of uh, nitrogen oxides and hydrocarbons out of those, out of our residual coke uh, ovens and, and steel industry to the extent that it's left. Uh, and so ozone is a very complex issue uh, in terms of how it's formed. But there, in Wyoming, surprisingly, is now we see the ozone standard. Again, I'm just, in a sense, stalling, but because I can't help but uh, be the academic, I'm in a university setting. Uh, ozone's a classic example of it's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Our ozone days that we exceed the standard, and I didn't look up to see whether Rochester does it all. Uh, but certainly in those parts of the country where we do exceed the standard, ozone occurs on warm summer days and requires basically sunlight acting on these oxides of nitrogen and hydrocarbons. It can occur many miles downwind. It occurs specifically on warm summer days where kids are outdoors playing. And kids are the most sensitive individuals to it. They're particularly sensitive to ozone. It's particularly bad for their growing lungs. It leads to increased asthma attacks. And when you're exercising, of course, you end up breathing more. So you end up with a conjunction of just the days that those kids are outside all day long exercising are the days in which there's a lot of ozone. And uh, there's no question it's adverse effects from it. What we don't know is what, in aggregate, the Marcella Shell activities are going to cause. That's an interesting point about the timing of emissions. One thing that I sort of tossed out as a hypothetical is maybe we should look at when the air quality damage days are, danger days are, and not allow any um, hydrofracking related trucking on those. <laughs> um, so we have quite a, a mix of questions here, and uh, there's a large cluster of them around hydrofracking chemicals, particularly those that are used, um, that are injected into the wells. What are they? How much do we know about them now? Um, and do we, you know? And what happens to them after they come? Uh, there's a long list of these chemicals. You can look it up on our track tracker website. Uh, as I look at them. Uh, None of them are on my highest priority list of, uh, gee, that chemical looks like it's awful, it shouldn't be in the, uh, uh, shouldn't be anyone allowed to be exposed to it or shouldn't be uh, even produced. Um, but on the same token, 
Uh, none of them are well studied. And as a toxicologist, I know that despite the fact that I think I'm very smart and can look at chemical structure and make predictions, that I'm not that smart that I won't be wrong very often. And there's no way that these chemicals should be used without them being relatively thoroughly studied. And there's lots of mixtures of them, and you know, again, we're always concerned about mixtures, so we don't, you know, it's not a, I, I'm always worried about toxic soup kind of terminology, but it is a lot of different mixtures, and we're not sure how they interact with each other. There's at least one laboratory study showing that some of these chemicals, at least, well, I shouldn't say that, at least one of these chemicals when put on rock, ends up extracting arsenic out of the rock, that's a laboratory study. We have, at least in Pennsylvania, again, I, I apologize, I didn't look at the data for this area, but I suspect geologically it's the same. We have in our uh, northern tier counties, just below your southern tier counties, we have some areas which are relatively high in well water arsenic levels. So again, this is one of these things which, you know, laboratories that are happening in the real world, uh, the good news about arsenic is that the U.S. Geological Survey has taken a lot of studies, so we should be able to follow that and see if, in fact, more arsenic levels. You know, well, for most of these others, we don't have baselines. So that's a long-winded way of saying I'm ducking your question. I don't know enough to answer it. Uh, given that, um, there are also specific questions about the fate of these chemicals, so we may not know their exact toxicological impacts. Um, but what happens to them once they get in the environment? How long do they stay there? Um, do they break down over time? And what happens if they go through waste water treatment? Yeah, um, that, that's a very good question. What happens when, they, when, they, when they're in the environment? We have in our soil uh, uh, at least a few foot down uh, bacteria. Once you get below that, we don't. These are being injected at relatively low levels. The bacteria will decompose most of these chemicals. They seem to be the kind. I would predict toxicologically they would be broken down by bacteria. But we're injecting them far below where we have these natural processes. Uh, are there other processes down below that will cause them to break down? Don't know. Will they show up somewhere? Don't know. Are there uh, going to be uh, uh, seams underground? Uh, uh, where water goes, I mean, groundwater flow is uh, uh, sometimes very surprising uh, when you map it out and where it's thoroughly studied. Uh, and it tends to be thoroughly studied on waste sites, for instance, and when you do that, you find that, gee, it's, it's not going quite downhill or quite where you expect it is very often. I, I don't know how often you're gonna end up with these things coming out in places that they shouldn't be. Uh, in Morgantown, West Virginia, there's a, uh, a facility, a fracking facility that's started, that was about to start fracking that is uh, on a, on a I, as I, I'm told, and I don't know this, I should be very careful, I don't know this for a fact, I was just told this story in West Virginia this past Friday. Uh, but it, it's going to perhaps release the fluids in a place that's about 1,500 foot, as I remember the amount I was told, upstream from where the intake for water supply is for the city. The city has put a more to basically say you can't do that. The company is now, and, and the person who owns the lease who would make the money from this being done, are now both suing the city of Morgantown to try to get uh, relief from uh, Morgantown putting rules in there that won't allow them to proceed. So uh, how that law case is going to work out, I don't know, but these are the kind of issues which you're just sort of saying, well, now, wait a second, before you put that in, before you put in, if it was a waste disposal site, you'd have to study that. You'd have to see where the flows are going. You'd have to have some understanding of it, rather than just putting it in and then saying, well, gee, yeah, maybe I can, it does come out there, but then I don't know that it does. 